Good morning. Internet Grandpa here. We're going to read Carry On Mr. Bowditch, Chapter 17. Let's get to it. Lunars and Moonlight. Mm. Moonlight sounds romantic. I want to hear all about everything, Nate, Elizabeth said. Dr. Farrell smiled. We both do. Nate thanked him. He told Elizabeth he'd try to see her soon. When I get over feeling like a fool, he told himself. Just now, he said, he must go to the custom house with Captain Prince. Perhaps this evening, Elizabeth asked. It might be a week or two before he could see her, he said. He'd be awful busy taking care of cargo. For a moment, Elizabeth's eyes studied him gravely. Then she smiled and said it was fine he was home. She left the wharf, wharf with David Farrell. After Captain Prince and Nate reported to the custom house, they went to Mr. Derby's office. Mr. Derby questioned him briefly and nodded. His mind seemed to be on the success of the Astrea. He told them news of the war threat. The trouble with France dragged on. It'll never be settled until this country wakes up and builds a navy, Prince said. Mr. Derby nodded. President Washington knows he needs a navy. He unfolded a newspaper. Here's what he said in his eighth annual message to Congress last December. He read some passages he had marked. To an active external commerce, the protection of a naval force is indispensable. It is in our experience that the most sincere neutrality is not a sufficient guard against the depredation of nations at war. To secure respect to a neutral flag requires a naval force organized and ready to vindicate it from insult or aggression. This may even prevent the necessity of going to war. Peace through strength. Prince said, and he's right, but when will he convince Congress? They're finally convinced, Mr. Derby said. They've authorized the building of six frigates. Humph, Prince said, six frigates. Mr. Derby nodded. I know, it's not enough. I'm urging the government to let private citizens build warships too. Salem will build a frigate the minute we have permission. Nate thought of what men said of Mr. Darby, that he could see around corners. Did he see war coming now? In spite of all our efforts to stay at peace? Mr. Derby's secretary interrupted to say that Mr. Blunt, the publisher from Newbury, wanted to see them. A moment later, an impatient young man entered the office, nodded briefly to Mr. Derby and Captain Prince and glared at Nate. I was talking to Mr. Collins, he said. He tells me you think you found an error in Moore's navigation. I did. In which table? Nate told him. Mr. Blunt gave a short laugh and relaxed. Do you know who compiled that table? Neville Maskelyne, the Royal Astronomer of England. You'd be apt to find a mistake in, well, Newton's Principia. Principia, Nate said. I did find an error in it. Let's see if I can quote the spot. Well, roughly translated, it went something like this. And he quoted the passage and pointed out the error. Mr. Blunt's jaw fell. Well, I'll be. Where did you go to college? London? Paris? You didn't get that kind of education here. Where did you go? I didn't. Mr. Blunt opened his mouth twice before any sound came out. Finally, he said, um, could you point out the error in Maskelyne's table? Which one, Nate said. There were several. Mr. Blunt's round face swelled and turned red. At last, he swallowed hard and muttered, all of them. Captain Prince said, you might ask him about his new way of working lunars, Mr. Blunt. A new way of working lunars? Nate explained it briefly. Mr. Blunt's jaw dropped again. But, but, that's tremendous. I'd like to include it in the new edition of more that I'm bringing out. And, and if you could, just cast your eye over some of the tables in the book. You don't cast your eye over navigations, Nate barked. When I checked that one table of masculines, I worked every figure three times just to be sure I was right. Three times? Every figure? But why in, why not, Nate roared. Mathematics is nothing if it isn't correct. Men's lives depend on these figures. Mr. Blunt swelled up and turned red again, but after a little, he said, quite so, Mr. Bowditch. I wish we had time for you to check all the tables and more. 
At any rate, I certainly want to include your method of taking wounders. Nate promised to see him in two weeks when they'd take him care of their cargo. Soon, he, Captain Prince, and Mr. Derby were deep in figures. Time and again during the next two weeks, Nate thought of Elizabeth. Was he ready to see her now? Ready to feel like a big brother or a father or something of that sort? He'd give himself a little more time, he decided. When he was done checking on cargo, he was glad he had another excuse to put off seeing her. He must talk to Mr. Blunt about Moore's Navigator. I wish we had time for you to check all the tables, Mr. Blunt repeated, but a great many of the signatures of the book are already printed. I must have seen, he must have seen Nate's bewilderment. He said, perhaps you think of a signature as a man's name. We printers have another meaning for it. A signature is a single large sheet of paper on which certain pages of the book are printed. We arrange the pages so that when the signature is folded and trimmed, the pages are in order. Nate said he'd be glad to check some of the tables that weren't printed. Glad of an excuse to keep busy, he thought. He worked on the tables and thought of Elizabeth and stayed somewhere under the figures most of the time. I'm getting over it, he told himself, but every time there was a knock on the door, his heart jumped. Maybe it was a message from Elizabeth, but it never was. Dr. Prince came to see him. I just wanted to remind you, Nate, the philosophical library is still open to you if you want to read the books. Nate thanked him. I've been thinking about the library, Dr. Pence. I'd like to join it now, if it's all right with the members. More than all right. We'd be honored to have you. Dr. Prince's eyes sparkled. I'm sure the book will be a pleasure. The books will be a pleased. No one else has ever understood them so well as you. I'm sure the books will be pleased. <laughs> no one else has ever understood them as well as you. Uh, that's humorous. Dr. Hollyoak came wanting to hear all about the lunars firsthand and to talk astronomy with Nate. Nate felt a warm glow of pleasure. Dr. Hollyoak was more than a beloved physician. He was one of the founders of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Boston. I corresponded with quite a few astronomers, Dr. Hollyoak said but I don't have much of a chance to talk to one. I'm no astronomer, Nate protested. And here we have a picture of Elizabeth on the captain's walk, apparently. So I'll make sure your kids understand that uh, Nate is feeling like uh, Elizabeth is interested in another guy. And uh, he's kind of jealous and kind of hurt. And uh, I think we're going to find out here in a little bit what's going on, but we'll see. So, where do we leave off? I'm no astronomer, Nate protested. No, but you figured an easier and more accurate way to check longitude. Astronomers and scientists have been working on that for quite a while, for several hundred years. The chronometer is the best way, Nate said, when all ships can afford a chronometer, until they can. They'll bless you and your lunars, even if you aren't an astronomer. Come to think of it, I believe a carpenter invented the chronometer, didn't he? Dr. Holyoke grinned and was gone. Alone again, Nate tried to work, but it was no use. He really should call on the boardsman, he told himself. He should tell Mrs. Boardman about the man he bit in Manila, who'd known her husband. And the boardman's old Mina greeted Nate with a smile. At the Boardman's, old Mina greeted Nate with a smile. Mrs. Boardman and the girls would be so sorry to miss, miss him, she said. They were in Boston. Hard to tell when they would be back. Mrs. Boardman wrote that they were having a fine time. So many parties. David Farrell was in Boston, too. Nate went back to his work. Autumn came. The trees flamed scarlet and yellow. The harvest mood was gold. A note came for Nate in Elizabeth's handwriting. His fingers shook when he opened it. A group were going Thursday night to a farm par for a party, Elizabeth wrote. The grown-ups will visit in Mr. Wiggins house, but we're going to have a party in town, a husking bee and a bob for apples and everything. I hope you can come especially. Nate went to sleep smiling. She wanted him especially. Thursday morning, he saw David Farrell. David was cheerful too. We're awfully glad you can come, Nate. I. Well, this is just between us, but I'm hoping to make a very important announcement tonight. Are you? Nate realized how flat his voice sounded. 
He forced himself to smile. That's fine. Nothing settled yet, David said, so you won't tell anyone. Not a word, Nate promised. He went home with a cold lump in his chest where his heart should be. So that is why Elizabeth was hoping he could come, especially. He was to be the first to know, among the first to know. Big brother, Nate muttered. It's a wonder David did, didn't ask my permission instead of his, her mother's. Five times that afternoon, he decided he wouldn't go. Five times, he changed his mind. At seven o'clock that evening, he was alone in a crowd in Wiggins' barn. Not that anyone could tell how he felt. He was sure of that. He knew his face kept smiling all the time. He'd given it a good talking to before he came. He knew his tongue kept making the right answers, but his thoughts were anywhere else, everywhere else. The party at Mary's where he'd first talked to Elizabeth, the morning after Lisa's funeral when Elizabeth had brought him the Latin book. Most of all, the morning he sailed on the Estrella when Elizabeth told him goodbye, when Elizabeth stood on tiptoe and kissed him. The crowd began husking corn. David called cheer cheerily. Here, Nate, sit by us. We saved you a place. I think that this is a good time to stop. And we'll get back to it in part two. So Nate thinks that David is going to going to announce that he and uh, Elizabeth are getting married. I don't know if you understood that or not. And Nate's pretty jealous. He was hoping that Elizabeth liked him since she kissed him and all. Guess we'll find out later. Love you. Bye-bye for now.